Hello, everyone, and welcome to Tamaz Dubozi on building the perfect decrepit utopia. My name is Maha Aib. I am the stage manager for this event. I'm pleased to welcome you to our 10th annual Wild Writers Literary Festival, which is brought to you by Wordsworth Books, the Balsili School of International Affairs, and the New Quarterly Literary Magazine. Before we begin, I would like to extend our heartfelt thanks to our festival donors and sponsors, including the Ontario Arts Council, the Knapp Wealth Management Team of RBC Dominion Securities, and the Audi Kitchener Waterloo. And now, I'm pleased to introduce our moderator for this event. Agnes Bashigi MacDonald is a Hungarian-Canadian sociologist, born in Budapest and moved to Vancouver, Canada in the early 1990s. Agnes has been enjoying the experience of living a hyphenated identity. The two-ness of being Hungarian and Canadian has given her a particular immigrant view, which she has been tapping into through her studies and scholastic work. Agnes completed her MA in Sociology and PhD in Comparative Literature at the University of British Columbia. Since her graduation in 2010, she has been teaching sociology at various institutions in Vancouver. In 2007, Agnes reviewed Tamás Dubozi's book, Siege 13, in the Journal of American Hungarian Educators Association, and interviewed Tamás for the New Hungarian Voice, which was republished in La Presence Hongroas, O Canada, in in 2007. And now to begin our festival, I will turn things over to Agnes, who will introduce Tamas. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Maha, for your introduction. It's wonderful being here. And hello, Tamash. So good to see you. Tamash Dobzi is a professor in the Department of English and Film Studies at Wilfrid Laurier University. He lives in Kitchener, Ontario. He has published four books of short fiction entitled when, e uh, when X equals Marilou, Last Notes, and Other Stories, Siege 13 Stories, which actually won the 2012 Rogers Writers Trust of Canada Fiction Prize and was shortlisted for, the, for both the Governor, Governor General's Award Fiction and uh, also the 2013 Frank O'Connor International Short Story Award. And most recently, Ghost Geographies Fictions, he has published over 70 short stories in journals such as One Story, Fiction, Agni, and Granta, and won an O. Henry Prize in 2011 and the Gold Medal for Fiction at the National Magazine Awards in 2014. Thank you so much for being here with us, Tamaj. This is fantastic to see you again. And um, I want to say hello. <laughs> Bonjour. Servus. How are you, <laughs> yeah, awesome. Uh, well, times have changed dramatically, uh, I think, since we have last talked like this. Um, we go way back, as I just mentioned, 14, 15 years for knowing each other. Yeah. I originally interviewed you, yeah, for, for the New Hungarian Voice in 20, 2007, it was in fact, yeah. and then yeah. Uh, we spoke doesn't again. seem it doesn't seem that as no long as it that, does not <laughs> yeah what happens with time since that time yeah. wrap of speeding up is happening when you when you when we think about these kind of events mm -hmm. um and then we spoke again in 2012 when um uh, with, uh, in relation to your um siege 13 and I, I wrote the book review so both of these books actually tap into your own biographical sources to produce fictional worlds and experiences of the places and characters. Um, for you, home is both in Canada and in Hungary and also in neither countries. Mm -hmm. You have uh, geographical experiences of being in between these two places, embodying them and leaving behind your ghost until you return to them. So I feel that this, this story um, that we are going to talk about today, it's kind of like a hangover fog. Uh, your newest book entitled Ghost Geographies, which is also the title of one of your short stories in the book, mm. exposes a past and the present world in Hungary, in Budapest and parts of Canada. Um, these stories to me um, express kind of liminal emotions that come from existing in suspicious and bureaucratic spaces. Mm -hmm. These characters are victims of life after the, the Second World War and the life that continues like an endless and internal battle within those left with memories of the war, communism, and emigre life in, in Canada. 
The book in its collection of short series describes um, a world, for instance, Franz Kafka would easily identify with and draw fuel from for his literature. You inhabit your protagonist's stories with a collective sense of dread, confusion, and unresolved remorse. <laughs> in this short story collection, the form and style of short story take new dimensions. So let's let's look at that first. Let's look at form and style. Can you sure. talk a little bit about how you play around with your um, and with your inspiration inspiration for for the form of short yeah. story? Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's. Um, especially with this book, I think I was really trying to push the form in new directions. I think that um, uh, I'm, I'm, I have a re really hard time repeating the same formula over and over again. I, I imagine that's true of, of many writers and artists where you're everything, you have to be excited about your work. I always think that if I'm bored when I'm working on something, people are going to be bored when they're reading it. And so there's always this feeling of let's try something new. Let's try something different. Let's keep, you know, keep moving to avoid that kind of boredom and repetition. And in this book, I really wanted to push the, the, the form as far as, as I could push it. Um, so there are stories in the book, like, um, like Nom de Guerre, which is written right. in the form of an introduction to a critical biography. Right. You know how at the beginning, I don't know if that term is generally understood, but it's essentially a year by year breakdown of yeah. the subject's life. So um, it has basically every single year of the character's life uh, written out uh, and then the story kind of, I don't know if you can see that, kind of follows those years. Um, and I thought it would be interesting to write a story that way because I could cover the entire life. I could do four or five decades and have all the world events taking place. And I could have uh, uh, you know, large events taking place all within a short story. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of a lot of what I'm doing is I'm trying to get out of that kind of um, slice of life short story yeah. that yeah. is a great it's a great form and you know we inherited that from Chekhov and yeah. everyone's been working with it ever since. But I wanted to go past that. I wanted to be able to do things with the short story that in some way are older forms of the short story right. where you would frequently have an entire character's life in the space of a story, or you would have um, um, uh, events taking place sometimes over decades in the space of a single story. So really what the slice of life story was written against. I was kind of trying to get back to that kind of form. So that's one story. And then there's a story in there called uh, Lester's Exit, in which I wanted to write a story that was like a documentary, where right. there are people being interviewed and the story emerges from their recollections mm -hmm. without the presence of a first person narrator. Yeah. I wanted to avoid the first person narrator, but I still wanted to have the feel of a kind of provisional, contingent, very subjective approach to the development of the story. So I've always been stuck between the first person voice, uh, the unreliable narrator, and then the third person, omniscient, know-it-all, God's <laughs> point of view kind of right. voice. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've always been trying to figure out, is there anything in between there? Yeah. Um, or is there any alternative to those things? So th those forms have emerged out of that struggle with that problem. Okay. And I didn't want to write autofiction. I wanted to, I, I, don't, I don't, I have no desire to write autofiction. So I'm trying to look for a new way to right. tell these stories so those are just some of the, the forms that I was playing with there. Wonderful, yes. And it's really great to 
have the insider view into um, the making of um, these new forms in your, in your stories here. Um, also in its form and style, the long sentences that I'm really picking up on in, in your stories are seem to be really stretched beyond, the, beyond the, our eyes, the reader's eyes, ability to hold words together, um, which is kind of like an effect which make the described events and experiences having a, kind of like a heavy weight. Um, for example, in um, the, the story called The New Improved Oscar Teleki, on uh, pages two, uh, 208 to 209, and just in the very bottom part, um, there's a really long sentence here that I, I'm going to try to read and probably okay. be fumbling, but let me try. It says, for this would be the distorted utopia Teleki held to all his life, the one visionary claim in a work otherwise dedicated to uh, practicalities, to demonstrating his gratitude to the West, though there in subtext only so faint you would have it had to known him as Varga, knew him to see it, a word where no promises of allegiance were made, none kept to ideology, to faith, to love itself, a place where no one made such as a move either in aggression or defense for at any moment it could all switch around. Friends become enemies, enemies become friends, a society perfected by indecision, disorientation, passivity. That was, that was a long one, no? Yeah. <laughs> one of the long ones. Yeah. yeah. Um, so here, Telaki, who was originally the director of the Budapest Zoo in the 1920s and until the, the Second World War, in, um, is actually seen to me the same Oscar Telaki uh, since he's 13. Yes, he is. Uh, yeah, in, in yeah. the animals of the Budapest Zoo. Um, yeah. Um, I feel that this zoo is, is a bit of a, a microcosm that was Budapest during the, the war field, uh, war, um, um, Second World War, kind of um, mm -hmm. lots of ghosts um, in, this, mm -hmm. in this Budapest, maybe yeah. even Teleki uh, or yeah. his, his ghost. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah that, story is, that story is sort of Teleki's final fate. Right. Um, so you have Teleki in... Um, the the animals of the Budapest Zoo story. You also have Teleki in the encirclement story, uh, and then you have Teleki in this book in in yeah. that story. Yes, and that, this is sort of the the, the final part of his story uh, okay. presented. Yeah, um, the long sentence is um, a sentence that I love to use because it has its own kind of music. And, okay. mm -hmm. and when you, when you are writing, and I, I came to understand this late, is that the music of the sentence is as important as the, as the meaning of the sentence. Okay. So the, the emotional register that you create as a writer for a certain idea um, is dependent on the way the sentence's music comes across to the reader. Wow. So yes. certain kinds of repetition, certain kinds of subordinate constructions, certain kinds of um, uh, uh, repetitive forms um, can all create a kind of um, uh, uh, melody that, yeah. that, that in a way, uh, enhances the way somebody takes meaning from the sentence. So, so for me, the long sentence um, has its own kind of um, a sound, and I and I try and use it to enhance those kind of emotional effects in the writing. Same with the short sentence; it has its own, yes. it has its own uh, staccato, its own kind of um, um, uh, effect on almost on your nervous system. Um, and so, so I use all these different things to try and enhance the emotion in the work. And that's, that's why I, I do that. Um, it's like an em in the emotion work, yeah? It kind of uh, that, that aspect of, of, uh, of the story that it's not just the content, yes. not just, not, not just the, the meaning making, but yeah. this, this whole the form. form. Yes. Yeah, 
Yeah. 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 So, so for me, that's, that's a really critical aspect to writing. And maybe, maybe that's even the hardest part of mm -hmm. writing to master is when to deploy that music and, and how to deploy that music so that it does what you want it to do. Yes, yeah, exactly. With, with the kind of rhythm that you're envisioning for the readers to also pick up and have yes. be in sync with your rhythm. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah fantastic. Yeah. Um, let me go on to another, another story in your book uh, called Crosswords here. Okay. Uh, we encounter uh, an ongoing intergenerational situation, intergenerational quarrels between Ferry and his son, Frank. Yeah. Um, Ferry's wife and uh, Frank's mother, Yulishka, dies on November 11th in 1984, the very day of Canadian Veterans Memorial. Also a very pertinent day for right. us. We just celebrated like, across the nation. Yes. Here. Yeah. yeah. Um, here, Ferry was all de de being depicted by you as a veteran, but not in the Canadian army. He, he fought on the wrong side of the Second mm -hmm. World War in the Hungarian army. Mm -hmm. His uh, fellow Canadian veterans keep reminding him uh, to be grateful in their polite way. Mm -hmm. They say when they visit him, calling mm -hmm. him out to go into the, go, go um, do the Memorial Day celebrations and right. quite upset about these invitations usually. So the his fellow Canadians say, um, we fought uh, so you'd have a country like Canada to come to. Realize yeah. that, Ferry. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Ferry is quite, uh, you know, rough in his response, crude and direct in his Hungarian to yeah. tone, saying that if you uh, hadn't fought, I wouldn't have needed a country like Canada yeah. to come to. It's, you know, it's yeah. quite kind of brash there, what yeah. you're saying. <laughs> but what do you mean for Ferry to express here so <laughs> poignantly? <laughs> yeah. Well, that story is basically about two groups of people who are congenitally incapable of imagining each other's experience. So they both have this kind of um, uh, narrative, very simple minded narrative of what the Second World War was yes. in a moral mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. And neither side is willing to grant the other person any validity, right? So the mm -hmm. veterans say, yes. we fought to, so there would be a free Canada. So you, people like you would be able to come to a free country and live and have your lives. And he responds, well, wait a minute. If you hadn't fought against us, <laughs> uh, our country would have been okay. And I could have stayed there and I would have been happier there. Um, so, so there's this kind of inability to kind of uh, uh, accept the complexity that would result from both sides truly communicating what right. was happening. So they both just have these very simple narratives. You know, on the one hand, you've got the veterans and it's just sort of that kind of straight up patriotic kind of cliched vision yes. that we're presented on Remembrance Day. Yes. And on Ferry's side, you've got a very selfish, uh, me, me, me kind of, uh mm -hmm. attitude where the second world war is my personal story mm -hmm. and there's really mm -hmm. not much more to it than that and so you've you've got this thing and i was hoping that by bringing those two sides together for the reader that's where the complexity would emerge and the reader would go oh yeah right there this is an, actually a very complicated historical moment with a very complicated historical legacy that you can't simply read through these various sort of cliches and through these various national lenses that simplify yeah. and make and make uh, uh, a kind of heroic narrative out of out of what was actually a, a very um, unclean situation for or a very unclean or by unclean i don't mean morally unclean i mean uh 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 complicated uh, yes. narrative right yes. so so that's kind of what i was doing with that with that story um and then caught in that in the crossfire there is the is the sun um, Thank who, you. <laughs> yeah, who who understands both sides and sees both sides yeah. And is trapped in this kind of horrible conflict and can't get out of it. 
Um, and so that to me, that that is my my generation's right, uh, yes. uh, position when on the one hand you've got your 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 immig immigrant parents who uh, who have a particular kind of story but then you're also raised in a country that has a very other different kind of story and you're trying to negotiate how these two pieces of of mutually exclusive information could emerge out of the same reality you know, that's, yeah. that's really what I was trying to explore in that story. And it may be to some degree in, in all my stories, I'm trying to, to figure that out. And um, that, that's good. That's okay. I mean, it doesn't mean that you're always trapped in that role or in that identity, no, but it, it's no. good to kind of have it, have it out there because that's your reality. You know? It's one of the, it's one of the things you, you contend with, you know, yeah. it's one of yeah. the things, it's one of the <laughs> things you have to sort out. Yeah. And it, it's dramatic and it's funny and it makes for a good story too. So, <laughs> you know, you use the material that you're given, uh, which is what I've done. So, um, yeah, that that would be my kind of long answer to your question. I'm not sure I, I answered it fully. Yeah. No, that's, that's great. I'm also just wondering... Uh, this whole idea of the crossword, what that fairy is trying to fill in those, those last, um, the last word, I think it's a four letter word. And I'm wondering if that's also some sort of symbol for being trapped, being trapped as in fairy being trapped or Frank being trapped in his yeah. father's crossword and then you being trapped yeah. in, in this yeah. crossword of literature that you're trying to make sense of. Right, yeah. Well, actually, actually it's interesting because, um, because that story was originally called number 10. Okay. Because there's I mean, 10, there's 10 arguments, right? All right, okay. Um, okay. So it's called, no, it was called number 10. Uh, and then um, uh, one of my editors at New Star, uh, his name's Vlad Kristash. Right. Um, he said that he suggested crosswords as a title. And I thought, wow, that's yeah. a really good, that's a really good title because it's, mm. It's crosswords literally is in the crossword puzzle, but it's also crosswords like these, mm -hmm. these arguments that these people yeah. have been having for 10 years. And so I thought that's a, that's a much better title. So we, we retitled it. Um, the crossword puzzle at the end is, is sort of this classic thing, right? Where it's the Greek goddess of victory, right? It's, it's four letters yep. and everyone knows that that's Nike. Right. And I, Nikkei, Nikkei, I guess in, in yeah, Greek, Nikkei. Nikkei. But, but the but the Hungarian father in the story. <laughs> um, and this this is actually this is a this is a true story. Okay. It's a, this is a true story. <laughs> awesome. Uh, I, I'm not going to go too far into the truth of it, but it's a true story. <laughs> the Hungarian father says it can't be. It can't be the same as in English if it's Hungarian, because Hungarian is a European language, and, <laughs> right. and it and, and European and languages not. are closer yeah. to the in spirit to the <laughs> Greek and Latin sources. Yeah. So it must be neat. Uh, what's Nike in English must be Nikus in Hungarian. In Hungarian, yes. Well, I mean, it's absurd because in Hungarian it's Nike. It's exactly the same except with an accent on the e, mm -hmm. and and so the son, who knows the English word, is actually closer to the truth of the Hungarian word than the father, who, because he rejects everything that's English, has yes. to reject that word as well. Of course. And he invents a phony Hungarian <laughs> word that doesn't exist to try and fill to it in. That one out. Yes. Based, based on this completely crazy, uh, uh, jingoistic, uh, 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 prejudiced, uh uh nationalism that yeah. he that inhabits his brain you know yeah so now hungary is closer to greece than england would be you know therefore it can't be the english it can't be a word that sounds anything like the english <laughs> no. word it has to sound more like a greek word anyway so it's it's just completely nuts and mm -hmm. uh and i think that i just used that episode hopefully humorously to bring out just how ludicrous this this mindset is that the father mm -hmm. inhabits. That, that was just extremely well done and poignant. And yeah, I really, I really enjoyed that story. 
Um, in the meantime, I also would like to remind our, our um, audience or our viewers to feel free to post questions in the Q&A chat box. Uh, it's open, so if you want to start doing it, please, please go ahead and we'll be looking at those questions um, towards the end of, of our meeting here. Um, Tamash, let me um, um, talk about some, some other stuff in your book here. When we were um, chatting through email earlier in preparation for the interview today, you said at one point that the idea of the decrepit utopias of people making do with the ruins of one's grand designs and how the prospect of the utopian might be better understood as a way of behaving rather than a way of arriving at a perfect mm -hmm. place free from the contingent contingencies of materiality and history, um, I'm quoting from your email, uh, seems to be um, as the touchstones um, of the sentiment in your stories, at least that's sort of, I'm, I'm picking up on that. Mm -hmm. I, I see this in, coming unfolded best in um, the story of the hobo and the archivist, mm -hmm. in, in Ray Electric, mm -hmm. and the rise and rise and rise of Thomas Sarges, mm -hmm. and probably others as well, but these mm -hmm. ones just, I really wanted to, to point out. Can you elaborate a little bit on this idea of utopias? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a that's a concept that I've been working on for a long time and, and researching for a long time. So within the word utopia and the genesis of, of the idea of the utopian, so there's there's two Greek, there's apparently two Greek roots for the word utopia. Okay. One is utopos, which means no place. Okay. And the other is utopos, which means beautiful place. Oh, wow. And so okay. the word the word comes out of this ambiguity of of um, uh, nowhere impossible to or, or the other possibility, which is beauty. You know, mm -hmm. the aesthetic. Right. What's What's interesting in this is that in both roots there is the word place. Yeah. So it's the idea of creating or arriving at or engineering a place we can get to where once we get there, all of our problems will be done. Our personal problems, our social problems, all of those things will disappear and we'll all be happy as long as we're in that particular place. So we have to somehow get there. Right. Yeah. And once we're there, we won't have to deal with history anymore because history is the record of pain and agony. Right. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. what history is. It's yes. it's problems and how we overcome them. That's yeah. history. Um, but once we get to utopia, there'll be no more history. Mm -hmm. So. The the problem, of course, is that because we haven't identified this place, because this place is not available to us on any map we have to create it. And so you've got the myriad experiments in utopian um, place building, uh, whether it's the Soviet Union, whether it's Nazi Germany, whether it's, you know, some of these communes that existed in the in the sort of um, 17th century mm -hmm. um, or religious communities in in Central and South America or wherever. Mm -hmm. And they're all they're all almost all uniformly a disaster. You know, the only one that yeah. holds out a tiny glimmer is the is the sort of very brief sort of an anarchist uh anarchist project in barcelona before the spanish civil war right. where yes. for a little mm -hmm. while it looked like maybe they had figured it out mm -hmm. and then between the stalinists and the fascists they yes. were destroyed yes. yeah um but anyway so a lot of work on utopia shifted away from thinking of the utopian in terms of place because that seems to bring with it all kinds of trouble. Mm -hmm. What if instead we think that utopia is not a place, it's a process. Okay. It's, a way, it's a way of doing things. It's not an arrival at, at a place that's going to look after us and make us happy and get rid of our problems. Okay, right. But it's rather us disposing ourselves toward problems in a certain kind of way. And maybe that's a better way of thinking about the utopian and makes the utopian a more useful concept than this idea somehow that 
we have to work really hard so that at some point we can abandon our agency and be looked after. Yeah, that's so if we go fantastic. with them, if we go with the more processual utopia, then we stay in history. We still have to contend with our problems, but the utopian remains a kind of guide for our behavior, right? It yeah. becomes a disposition or an attitude. And so the stories are kind of playing with that idea. What does it mean to have a utopian disposition? Can you exist in a utopian sense in the midst of decrepitude, whether it's the, the tail end of, of Soviet communism, right. whether or not it's this emigre condition where you are entirely dispossessed, uh, whether it's um, within the aesthetic itself where you are contending with problems, but hoping to contend with them in a way that makes the best out of them. So that's in a way, where the work is is that's the dialogue that that's happening inside the work right that's that's fascinating for me to have this first-hand um, uh, explanation and um, um, kind of illumination of this um, notion of utopia that is is coming through so so well in, in in many of these stories at the same time I think they need need this kind of further elaboration for us to have uh, this expanded vision or this alternative uh, access to understand utopia. Would you say that in um, uh, the story called Ghost Geography is the title of your book, but also yeah. the title of one of the stories where uh, Shandor Esterhazy um, is an, an abandoned um, orphan child eventually makes over to Canada, makes it over to Canada and after the Second World War and um, sort of remains a, 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 an orphan type of personality identity. I, I feel that he, he himself embodies the ghost identity and his, um, his trick is to cross between Canada and the US border, sort of slipping through without papers and so forth constantly and making these maps of abandoned lands. Now, may, would, would you, is it too far stretched to say that maybe utopia is part of this map making of the abandoned lands that yes. that's maybe where utopia could be? Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so for Shandor, um, his whole life has been destroyed by the idea of nation, yeah. of borders, yeah. of nations, of hegemony, mm -hmm. of control. And so his very careful resistance to this notion is to build a kingdom out of all of those places that are invisible, that are ghostly, that we ignore. And so he stitches together a map of abandoned lots and fallen in housing and, and, uh, and uh, neglected properties and places that cannot be put to any kind of use, that becomes his kingdom. And that's, that's the world he prefers to inhabit to the one that the rest of us have to inhabit every day, which is, um, which is determined by controls of various kinds and propaganda of various kinds and myths of various kinds. Mm -hmm. And so he, in a sense, rejects all that and slips free of it, but it, at considerable cost, at considerable cost to himself. Yes. In, in yeah. essence, in essence, he does become a kind of ghost, yes. a kind of non-presence in the official world. Um, and that's his, that's his response to a, to a life that has been ruined by geopolitical strife. Yeah. Yes. of one kind or another yeah. so yeah that's that's the that's that story very much is at the heart of the of the book okay yeah um, let me let me pick up on this idea of geopolitical and the political and suggest that your writing definitely engages the political um at least in this book but i think in general um the confused struggles of the characters in the context of political schemes and existential crises in these stories are almost con comforting, at least um, somehow it seems to be something familiar to me. Mm -hmm. uh, these kind of struggles, yeah, uh, more than 
let's say the struggles we have been experiencing over the last year and a half with, due to the pandemic. So it's this different mm. kind of struggle. Yeah. Um, uh, to me, these stories bring out a particular taste or flavor or even of nostalgia for the pain, mm. a pain that was obvious, direct, touchable, for instance. Mm. In, in socialist Hungary, people knew their place and accommodated mm. their position for survival according, accordingly. Um, in fact, in one of my uh, third year sociology classes, I have just now assigned a reading about an informant agent. It's, it's an actual, it's a research about uh, secret agents in Hungary. And oh, yeah. this in, informed ag informant agent is called GY in Hungarian, the short form for probably George uh, or some, some name like that. Yeah. Um, he was um, an agent, secret agent uh, in the 1950s. He was um, really a flesh and blood spy who was recruited by the secret police of the Magyar Communist Munkáspár to provide yeah. information about fellow citizens, um, their thoughts, their actions, mm -hmm. and private lives. So while uh, this agent was uh, hesitant to comply in the beginning, um, he basically was left no choice but to carry out the demands of the authorities, yeah. or he'd be arrested on yeah. some previous minor, you know, misdemeanor charges. Right. So this, this text that I'm, I'm reading with my students uh, describes how most people in Hungary who worked as agents, there were many, made yeah. the reports in a particular art form of rhetoric whereby they'd learn to write based on schematized scripts, uh, such as word usage, structure of emphasis, timing of the reports and so forth. And once they had this, that structure standardized, they could embellish the report in such ways that the true and false events were, were hard to differentiate because they aimed to benefit the party's project on paper and what actually happened to people in real life. Um, so the reports became illustrations of inner feelings about uh, the most private experiences and desires of both the agents who were writing these reports and their subjects under surveillance. Um, Mm -hmm. wow. and, and the agents benefited, such as this uh, guy, for instance, uh, benefited from his reporter stories by gaining a higher position in his job, okay. higher salary, his daughter getting accepted into kindergarten, his wife receiving prioritized care mm -hmm. in the hospital, and so forth. So while most people knew that there were these agents amongst them and thus tended to be cautious about their spoken thoughts and actions mm -hmm. in fear from authorities, authorities yeah. they didn't, it, you know, it didn't stop them from living. Unlike things are stopping us now from living a little bit, yeah. you know, in more obvious ways. Mm -hmm. So in your story, Hobo and the Archivist, when I'm getting mm -hmm. to what I'm wanting to mm -hmm. ask, really, Adalbert Vitus, am I saying his last name correctly? I, I pronounce it Voits. Voits in a Dutch Flemish way, sort of Voits. Yeah, okay. Voits, so, yeah. Adalbert Voits, a Belgian writer who arrived in Budapest in the mid 1970s uh, at the invitation of Janos Kader, the leader of the Hungarian Communist Party. Um, um, he seems to be the only one who sees that Hungarians couldn't um, or don't want to see the intricate social network of, of what's happening to them. Yeah. You know, they are the ordinary citizens and yeah. the, you know, what the government agents are doing, yeah. what the government yeah. authorities are doing. So what's happening yeah. there? Who is this? Well, I mean, <laughs> the, the, short, the short answer to this question is that Voits is an idiot. Okay. That's, <laughs> yeah. the short, that's the short answer, right? Okay. I, I mean, I, I, I wrote that story very much with the sense that the reader is going to feel really smart compared to Voight okay. while yeah. reading the story. Um, and so he's a comic figure. He's a clown. He's a bumbler. And a large part of what makes him a clown is his absolute belief in the rightness of Soviet style communism while he's living in the midst of the misery it has turned his life into. Yeah. <laughs> right? That is sort of the what's happening in that story. And so, you know, there I'm I'm kind of critiquing this utopian mindset where it's like, you know, how how long can you continue to fasten yourself to this idea? while all around you staring you in the face every day is is its failure you know yeah and uh and so for me that character is a kind of um holy fool uh type of person <laughs> um and he he simply kind of uh uh continues on uh and and then 
And then at the end of the story, you know, he's very much, uh, you know, his, his whole pro his whole utopian project is the perfect city, the utopian right. city. Yes. So he's really the avatar of the idea of utopia as a place. If we could just create this place, yeah. we could get into it and then we'd be, we wouldn't have to do anything we'll be just anymore. Happy forever. Everything yeah. is going to be great, right? Yeah. You don't have to work. You don't have to struggle. Yeah. You don't have to yeah. argue. You'll never be unhappy, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, they're very naive. It's utopia is naive. It's very naive, it right? Is. The fact yes. that that some eventually, you know, we won't have to work. Like, wouldn't that be nice? Um, anyway, and then counter to him is this hobo, who's 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 this kind of mystery figure, uh, and he's he's sort of he's a wanderer, and he smells terrible, and his clothes yeah. are all filthy. Yeah. And he presents the other side of that utopian vision, which is I just kind of do what I do and everything seems to be okay. I'm, I have no desire, therefore I have nothing that needs to be fulfilled and so on and so forth. And that's more the disposition or the attitude, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so the story is kind of these two people coming together. Um, in it's very interesting what you just said and i'm gonna have to write you an email to find out all about this spy because i'm working on something very similar right okay. now um but uh yeah so that that's sort of where that story came out of but yeah. i must say that um i was at a i was at a, a festival a, a different literary festival a long time ago and i was on a panel with a, another writer and uh we were talking about all these things and she said at some point i do have to halt uh, our, our talk right now and just remind everyone in the audience that um, primarily these are stories these are narratives okay these are these are artworks that are that are more interested in aesthetic configurations of different things uh, for the purposes of experiencing an artwork than they are necessarily for conveying these grand conceptual mm -hmm. designs. Mm -hmm. That's what you meant. That so, way, yeah. okay. so I would I would just want to say at this point that when I write stories, I'm primarily writing them because I want to write stories and mm -hmm. I'm interested in these aesthetic configurations of character and event and humor and sadness and yeah. all those other contradictory things that we all experience all the time. So that's my primary motive. Right. And then and then these other things are kind of like a toolbox that I reach into if Can I you? want to create some kind of uh, uh, if, if I need help, you know what I mean? Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. To, to yeah. do things. So yeah. I would just add that. Okay. Yeah. Ah, uh, that's this is just so so awesome, and I have so many more questions, and I'm just being reminded that we hardly have any time left. I yeah. wonder if I could sneak in one more question before we go into Q and A. I'm not going to mind, but okay. uh, <laughs> I Maha will. I'm sure Maha will will be here if she if she needs to be. She'll swoop okay, in. Okay, Maha, interrupt me. Yeah. If uh, okay, <laughs> I just I I feel I need to finish with this one. Yeah. yeah. So you you tend to hyperbolize your female protagonists. Irene, Eva, Marius, Yulishka, yeah. Louisa, and more. They each seem as the perfect woman. They are beautiful, smart, edgy, task-oriented. Yeah. But something happens to them when they come to Canada. Yeah. Okay. Um, why do your women become disintegrated in, in Canada? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if I would lump all of those characters into the same boat. So that the the female characters in the hobo and the archivist right. are just as problematic as the yeah. men you know yeah. um the the character of yulishka in crosswords in a sense aid and abets the entrapment of the mm -hmm. son because she herself she gives him advice that she doesn't live up to herself, of right? <laughs> so she's a she's a deeply flawed character. I don't I actually don't see any of them as being ideal with the exception maybe uh well even her. Um so the character uh in um in uh uh um the right story right? no no well, well, that character is terrible. She's a spy. I, but I, mean, I love she's her. A, she's a complete. <laughs> I, I want to be a, like her. 
he's a complete cipher, right? <laughs> yeah. Now, she is also the character in Siege 13 in the story, The Society of Friends, who kills herself. Yeah, yes. That's yeah. the I, same I, I kind of had that person. feeling, yes. Okay. So that's her, that's wow. her fate. That's her fate. Right, yeah, um, in Canada, right. Yeah. And uh, and um, so the, the one character, I Irene, in um, in Ray Electric, okay, right, is yes. is is a kind of amazing character in the same way, uh, in the way she's trying to sort of save everybody, right, and yes. and trying to please everybody. Um, but I I don't think she's any more ideal than Banco. I mean, Banco is a is a is a very, in a way, very strange, yeah. ideal kind of character in yeah. the sense that he has all this strength and he never once uses it no. in an oppressive way. Yeah. Um, so I I actually don't see a huge, to be honest with you, I don't see a huge difference between uh, my male characters and female characters. I try and present all my characters as fully rounded human beings. Okay. By which I simply mean a mass of contradictions, maybe, because that maybe tends to be yeah. that tends to be how I see people yeah. is that we're, we're not stable, we're not consistent, we don't uh, we don't tend to be the same thing from moment to moment. Sometimes we think we're doing something good, and we are, but in that very same motion, in another context, we're doing something bad. Yeah, so absolutely. The same gesture can produce the same can produce two totally uh, opposite uh, uh, results at the same time. So for me, th this is how I think about characters in general. And so I always I always try and think, you know, how do I present these people in a way that that brings them to life? Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I think what I what I'm really trying to say that these women are perfect that. They are perfect because they are so flawed and oh, instead okay. of being perfect in the ideal sense that you know in many ways a lot of times in 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 our literature or or even you know fiction uh, movies and whatnot women are so perfect so ideal you know that perfect yeah. body the perfect yeah behavior, yeah yeah okay the perfect woman that needs to be attained and unattainable but also becomes extremely unattainable because she becomes so bodily but right. these Hungarian women are beautiful because they are so imperfect. That's uh -huh. why they are perfect. Okay. And, and right. That's that's what I admire. Oh, what what you meant? Yeah. Um, I, I just didn't I, really phrase it well. <laughs> yeah. One of the one of the things that I was really dealing with a lot in this book was um, Hungarian machismo. Um, yes. Yeah. And it's mm -hmm. and its effect on women. Mm -hmm. And I think I think probably the story Spires mm -hmm. is one of those stories. Yep. Yep. And and in some way, the Banco character is my antidote to it because he's a, a character who should be very macho. Not sure. but, <laughs> he, but he meets but he meets this woman who's essentially as tough as he is yep. and who doesn't take any any shit from yep. him. Yep. And and that's the basis of of their relationship mm -hmm. is this mm -hmm. kind of equality and so Banco to me was how can I write this guy who who has all the ingredients of that kind of machismo but doesn't exploit it and doesn't use it to oppress people yeah yes what, where would a character like that end up and it doesn't end up in a very good place but no. um but anyway that's that's something I was really concerned with in that text as a whole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's that's fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, Tamash. I think well, we are you. out of time right here. It was really wonderful speaking with you and, and hearing the, yeah. the details about uh, some of your stories and the making of, of this collection of short stories in ghost geographies. I, I'm, I'm just so grateful we had the chance to talk again. And I'm, I'm sure people are, are, are really keen to uh, ask you questions. So let me just... Um, and turn it, turn it over. Yeah, it there over. is one. There is one question already, and I'll okay. read them out loud because yes. I don't know if the people in the audience can see the questions. But this is from Andrew Wood, who says, "Tomash, could you expand on your process for implementing musicality? At what stage of revision do you use it to highlight as well as reduce the emotionality of a piece?" 
So that's a really good question. It's a three part question. So uh, yes, I will expand. So that's the easiest question to answer of the three. Um, at what stage of revision? Um, I'm doing it, Andrew, I'm doing it all the time. So I, I'm doing it when I write a first draft. I do it when I write a second draft. I do it when I edit. I'm always paying attention to the way the sentence sounds beyond what the sentence means. So I'm not, it's not like I write something and then I go, okay, now I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna put in the music. That's, that's not how I do it. I kind of do it all the time. It's always something I'm thinking about. And then do you use it to highlight as well as reduce the emotionality of a piece? Um, I'm, that's, a, that's probably the toughest question of the three because it's very easy to write an unemotional sentence. It's very easy to write a sentence that's not going to generate anything, any response emotionally on the part of the reader. So um, the problem is rarely getting rid of the emotion. The problem is getting the emotion right. Uh, that's usually the trick. But I will say that there are times when I write in a way because I want a bit of alienation and I want the reader to step back and go, wait a minute, what is this? What am I reading? What's going on here? And, and so I do do that. Um, and that is accomplished through uh, different means at different times, depending on what kind of material you're working with. Um, I used, I, there's a story in this book called Four for Klein Caro, where I use bits of screenplays to kind of um, break up that kind of uh, narrative uh, flow and to, and to suddenly present something that pulls the reader back. Um, so that, I guess, would be one example where I'm doing that. The other example would be Nom de Guerre, where because of that form, the sentences tend to be very clipped, you know, goes to Casablanca, comes home, uh, is enrolled in university, mm -hmm. meets so-and-so, you know, it's very kind of clipped. There's not a lot of um, um, uh, uh, elaboration. And because of that, the piece becomes very kind of um, uh, uh, cold. And I think I'm hope hopefully humorous because it, because it has that sort of like uh, almost marionette-like uh, movement to it in the writing. And I hope that creates humor. So I guess that's my answer to that question. I don't know if that does it justice, but, but yeah, that's my, my take on it. That's great. <laughs> okay, are there any more questions? I don't see any. Is there some? Oh, oh here we go. Okay. Jason B, do you include the Hungarian words as a form of alienation? Mm -hmm. um, hmm, that's a that's a really good question. That's usually not what I'm thinking of um, when I put them in there, and I, but I'm trying to think of what it is I am thinking of when I put them in there. Sometimes I put them in there because the Hungarian word in my mind is a truer word than the English. Uh, uh, word that I would put in there. Um, uh, it just feels right. Like the word meglevesh to me is a much, <laughs> well, you understand this, yeah. that word is not done justice by the translation of sour cherry soup. No. It doesn't really convey. It's not inviting. It's not inviting. No, no sour no, cherry no. soup sounds like something. Ugh, <laughs> get that away from me. Yeah. Whereas Maglavesh is this beautiful, comforting, <laughs> cool, high summer soup yeah. that you, you know, like it's almost like ice cream. You're just so yes, happy it to have it, it you know. <laughs> uh, so, so oftentimes that's what's in my mind is is that there's just sometimes this insurmountable divide in the language and so when I hit that I always revert to the Hungarian word that has the truer feeling to me so that's that's mainly why I do it 
I, I suppose, though, that for some readers, it, that might be alienating because they have no idea what it is I'm yeah, because you, you don't provide footnotes or no. notes in the back. No. And no. I mean, even no. stuff referring to politics, people would really have to know Hungarian politics or, or would have the that. interest to look things up. You know, you refer yeah. to the, the Kunista Chrysanthemum yeah. Revolution, right. uh, the AVO, right. and yeah. KVD. I don't even know some of these things. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. No, I know. I know. Yeah. I always think. Uh, um, uh, they'll, they'll look it up on Google if they really, they really <laughs> want to know. It's so easy now. You can look up yeah, anything. Sure. Uh, so, um, you know, Google Translate, what a, what a gift to all of us that right. is. Um, so thanks, Jason. Appreciate your follow up there. Thanks. All right. Is there anything else? I think, I think we're out of questions. We're out of questions, oh no. Yeah, I don't see any more coming through. So maybe this is the moment for Maha to come back and yes. clean, clean us up. Can, can I just <laughs> ask one more question, Tava? Yeah, yeah. Early, many years ago when we were first, first speaking, you, you said you, you don't um, teach Hungarian literature or don't involve much Hungarian topics in your classes, in your courses. Yeah. That is still stand? I'm not allowed to. I'm not no. allowed to. You're not allowed to, yeah. No, so it-, it You're teaching I'm, American literature. <laughs> I'm in the English department, yes. and the minute I bring in anything in translation, right. suddenly I'm, I'm trespassing on the turf sure. of the Department of Languages yes. and Literature. <laughs> so uh, I, I want to, you know, I don't want to steal anyone's job. Yeah. Um, I have mine, they have theirs. Which is too bad because I would I would love to bring in some stuff. Yeah, there's some amazing gems gems in I think I think in a creative writing class I might be able to yeah, yeah. to sneak in some contraband uh, <laughs> okay. literature cool. and present it. So yeah. I might I might still do that. Let's, but uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, very cool. Okay, thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tamash. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tomas and Agnes. It was such a lovely talk, full of humor, and I really enjoyed listening to you talk about the different characters in your writings. In closing, I want to remind our viewers that all our writers' books are available for purchase online from Wordsworth Books. Visit our online book table for a handy overview of all our festival authors' books. Don't forget that the next Wild Writers Literary Festival event is Writing for a Young Adult Audience, which is tomorrow, Sunday, November 14 at 11 a.m. Thank you all for attending today's session. Thank you all again. And thank Thanks, you so much. Agnes. Thank you, I will Mama. send you 